I'd like to welcome those that are joining us online for our service here at First Baptist Church and our Texan joining our worship. Our next hymn will be Since Jesus Came Into My Heart.
If you have your Bible, let's uh, turn once again to Ephesians chapter 4. We want to come back to our series that we were in before we took a break for the Easter celebration. And uh, now we're coming back to our series on spiritual gifts. Uh, I feel that we will probably uh, finish up this series by the end of May. We've got a couple more categories we need to look at. But uh, we are in the category of the support gifts, and we uh, started that uh, message a few weeks ago, and we're going to conclude the support gifts this morning. And so that's what we're looking at today. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how it instructs us, teaches us, motivates us, gives us the knowledge that we need in our life to know how to glorify you, to live our lives before you, to see you working in our life. And so, Father, uh, we just pray that you will open up our understanding this morning as we Break open the word of life. And we thank you, Father, for your word. We ask you that you just open up our understanding to the uh, predominantly teaching time this morning. We pray that we will have an ear to hear. May the Spirit of God, as always, be our teacher. We will praise you for what you bring to us today. For we pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen and Amen. amen. <coughs> Spiritual gifts are a very important part of what we receive as a Christian, as a child of God. It's interesting that as Paul began the book of Ephesians, he reminded the Ephesian believers, and God reminds us today, that we are already blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So we're already blessed, amen? with all of these spiritual blessings and riches that God has bestowed upon us. And part of that blessing, part of that uh, heavenly blessing He's given to us, these spiritual blessings are spiritual gifts that He's given to the body of Christ. You know, without spiritual gifts, the church would really not be able to function very well at all. Not in a spiritual sense. Now, people can still come together in a building, like we do here, and they could gather together, they could talk about things, and somebody could get up, give a little speech or a little something, and people could get up, play a guitar, sing a song, whatever the case may be, and say they're having church, but they ain't having church. There's got to be that spiritual dynamic, amen? The gifts of the Spirit have to be involved in what we're doing. That spiritual dynamic has to be there. <laughs> and these gifts enable us to do the work of ministry, to be able to minister our gifts to one another and to be able to minister those gifts out to others around us. And because these are special enablements that we would not in our own power be able to do apart from the work of the Holy Spirit, you see, because the Spirit of God is energizing us in these spiritual gifts, He gets the glory. Let me remind you, anything you do in the power of your flesh is not going to bring glory to God. Not going to bring glory to God. It's got to be the work of the Spirit. Now, we are presently considering the support gifts. And in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, uh, in fact, let's read verses 11 through 13 once again. And here's what he says. And he himself, that is Jesus himself, gave some to the apostles, 
some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry or the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, in verse 11, we have these particular gifted people that are presented to us here. And we are looking at what I call the support gifts. Now, let me put them on the screen for you once again so that we can be reminded of who we're talking about. The support gifts are missional in nature. And they are basically the, the, the uh, I'd say, the backbone of the church itself. Now, if you know anything about the human body, you know that we have a backbone, okay? And the spine is part of that backbone, and that's really the central support structure of our body, of our skeletal system. And, and so that spine is there. And, and, and it's what gives us our bodies that support. Well, all of these gifts right here on the screen that you're looking at are support gifts. They are the central support structure of the church. Amen? And, and, and think about those. I mean, you can look at them and you can see Every one of them have been necessary in the New Testament church. We've already talked about apostles. and Today, a missionary is similar to an apostle in some of the things that they do. We've talked about the prophet that was in the New Testament church. Today, I don't believe we have apostles in the sense that apostles are going and giving revelation of God like they did in the early church. No, we have all the revelation of God right here. It's in the Bible. Prophets, we have a prophet today in the sense that, for example, by uh, preaching the word, I am foretelling the word of God. Not foretelling the future, foretelling the word. I am foretelling the word of God that is here. Amen? So we have prophets in that sense. Primarily today, we have the evangelist, the pastor, elder, uh, the teachers. And so uh, we've talked about these uh, these first three in the last message. Now, looking at those, what do you see? You also see that they could also be speaking gifts, could Because every one of those particular individuals there, those particular types of ministries, have to do with proclaiming or getting out the Word of God. Amen? So they could very well be listed under speaking gifts. I have them under support gifts because of their nature. You've got to have those people in the local church. They are the central support system of the local church. They're the backbone. Now, you may be thinking, okay, pastor, we've been looking at some of these gifts. I have not yet seen deacon anywhere. Anybody wondered about that? Where's the deacon? Well, my beloved, deacon is not a spiritual gift. Deacon is an elected office. 1 Timothy chapter 3. It is an elected office. Now, having said that, let me remind you that there is one gift that every deacon has. And that is the gift of service, which we're going to be talking about a little bit later on when we get to the serving gifts. Amen? It's sometimes called the gift of ministry. It's called that in the book of Romans, chapter 12. And so every deacon has the gift of service, and if they don't have the gift of service, they're not a deacon. They, call, they have whatever the title they want to have, but if they're not a servant, they're not a deacon. Okay? But deacon is not a spiritual gift. Deacons have the spiritual gift of service. We'll talk about that later on. But that's why you're not seeing deacon. Because somebody might say, well, deacons are a support gift. No, they're not. Just an elected office. Okay. Now, 
These particular gifts, these support gifts, as I mentioned, are the backbone of the church. And we know they are because look what Paul says these individuals do right here in verse 12. These are the ones for the equipping of the saints. Why do they need to be equipped? For the work of ministry. Well, what, what, what does that do? For the edifying of the body of Christ. And so the church is edified, it's built up, God gets the glory through it all, and the saints are equipped through these particular gifted individuals. And let me remind you once again, these gifted individuals, they provide edification, they provide instruction and guidance and correction and leadership and knowledge, and they include both the gift and the person right here. Remember when we looked at the other listing of the gifts, you just saw the gift, right? But here we have the gifted persons that are mentioned in verse 11. So we're talking about gifted persons when we come to this particular area right here of support gifts. So they're a little bit different in that we're talking about not just the gift but the individual too. So that's important for us to see. All right. Now, I want to look this morning at the last two pastors and teachers. Now, verse 11 has been very controversial over the years because you've got good Bible scholars and Bible teachers, and they're, they're on both sides of the, the coin here, all right? And, and the question is, when it says pastors and teachers, is Paul lumping pastors and teachers together? In other words, should it be something like pastor-teacher because every pastor has to be able to teach? Is that what he's talking about? Or is there an actual separation there? If you go by the Greek text itself in verse 11, the Greek grammar makes it very clear that Paul is lumping pastors and teachers together in the same basket. In fact, you can see that in our English translation. Notice, notice how he works this. And Jesus himself gave, now notice, some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and teachers. Now, if Paul meant to have a separation there, a big separation between pastors and teachers, he would have put some teachers. Okay? So, from the grammar itself, Paul is putting pastors and teachers in the same basket. But then there's another question. Is he talking about the fact that pastors and teachers, just as pastor slash teacher, or pastors and there are the teaching people who have the, the gift of teaching, they're separate, but yet they basically do one, the, kind, the same kind of ministry. Well, what I believe, I believe that Paul is lumping them together in that they're both part of the teaching of the New Testament church. Pastors teach. Teachers teach. In that aspect, they're on the same side of the coin. Amen? But here's the difference. Every pastor has to, has to have the gift of teaching or he shouldn't be in the pastor. Because you've got to be able to instruct your flock. Amen? All right. So every pastor has the gift of teaching, but not every teacher has the gift of pastor. Okay? Because pastors have combination gifts that not every teacher is going to have. They may have the gift of teaching, but they may not have the gift of leadership or the gift of uh, administration, whatever you want to call it there, or the gift of shepherding. They may not have that. So, here's what I'm doing. I'm just letting you know that the text itself, Paul has them grouped together. But for the sake of the support gifts, I want to separate them as I bring them to you this morning. That's why I'm bringing all that up. Okay? Alright. So let's go to number four. The gift of pastor slash elder. And I put elder because elders 
Pastor can be called an elder. In some denominations, in some other churches, they are called elders instead of pastor. Sometimes even the word bishop is basically the same word. It means overseer, basically the same word as pastor. Pastor elder. We see the pastor in verse 11 here as a spiritual gift, a gifted person. Now, here's my definition of pastor elder. A person who has been chosen and called out by the Lord to lead the flock, feed the flock, and shepherd the flock of a local church. Now that's a pretty simple definition of a pastor. That's what I see it as. And I think it'll fly. I like it. Because I think it in a broad way, it tells you what a pastor basically does. Amen? All right. You know, pastors come in all shapes and sizes, don't they? Tall and short. Heavy and skinny. All different colors. Red or yellow, black or white. God can use them day and night. Doesn't matter. Pastors come in all different Nationalities, there are United States pastors, Mexico pastors, Japan pastors, Filipino pastors, African pastors. They're all out there. Amen. God has them out there. And pastors come in various temperaments. Some are a little bit high strung. And they tend to want to micromanage everything in the church, every little detail. Other pastors a little bit more laid back. And they tend to let the church and the leaders of the church do their own thing and their own ministries and really doesn't get that involved unless there's some questions and things going on that the pastor needs to be involved with. And so there are different temperaments. Pastors also come with various expectations from churches. I've been around the ministry for a number of years and been through a number of churches. And I've come to realize that every church has their own expectations about a pastor and what a pastor should do and shouldn't do. And so uh, sometimes they have things written down in the church so there's no misunderstanding. And sometimes there's an unwritten law that the pastor has to just sort of uncover on his own. You know, he's got to be a little detective. He's got his little spyglass. And he's got to figure out, okay, I'm just telling you the truth. Now, the gift of pastor is a gift, okay? It is a spiritual gift. It is a calling. But let me clarify that calling. First of all, there's a call from the Lord, and the, the individual knows God is calling me to pastor. He wants me to be a pastor. Okay? So it's a call from the Lord, but it is also a call from a church. What happens when a church is looking for a pastor? Someone comes in to preach in view of a what? Call. So the calling is both ways. But then not only is it a gift and a calling? It is also an elected office, just like the deacon is. Again, 1 Timothy chapter 3. And it is an elected office. I remember back in 2017 when I stepped down from my former church and, and retired from full from full-time pastor. Okay? And one of my members, and boy, he just really could not understand it. I had a hard time getting it across to him. He said, he said, I never thought you would quit. I said, who said I'm quitting? Well, you're retiring. I said, I'm retiring from the pastorate full time. Well, that means you're quitting the ministry. No, it doesn't mean I'm quitting the ministry. I'm still a preacher. I still have work to do for the Lord. Amen? And I couldn't get it through. 
And he said, well, I don't understand. I said, well, look, look. The pastor is an elected office. I said, now, if it's not an elected office, you know what that means? He said, what? I said, it means you can never fire a pastor. Think about that. Pastor can't be fired if it's not an elected office. <laughs> he, stopped, he stopped there a second. He said, hmm, okay, I, I, yeah, I get that. But he still had a hard time with me retiring in that sense. Amen? And so, so you can see that there's a lot involved with, with the pastor, okay? A lot involved. Now, what is the pastor basically supposed to do? Well, what I want to do, I want to look at, basic, I want to look at two passages. And from those two passages, I want to give you six basic things that pastors do. Okay? Let's go first of all to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, where Paul is writing to one of his preacher boys. Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Let me get over there. Now, this is familiar. Uh, just about all of you should. You've heard this. You, you probably know a lot of this by heart. But let me read verses 2 through 4. Here's what it says. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears. Paul says there's going to come a time in the churches where the people who are sitting in pews, they're going to have itching ears. And they want their ears to be scratched. So they're going to feel a little bit better. And, and he says, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth. Because these particular false teachers are going to be scratching their ears just right where that little itch is. Oh, that feels so much better. And be turned aside the fables. Now, right here, we see three things that a pastor does. First of all, verse 2 would tell us that he exhorts the flock. That is the preaching aspect of his ministry. He preaches the word, he exhorts the congregation, he encourages the flock, he, he is motivational. He's trying to help the flock not only to grow, but also to be fired up for Jesus. Amen? And so he's a preacher. He is, he's an exhorter. And he should be doing that with unction and passion. There needs to be a little passion from the pulpit. And I'll be honest with you. Whenever I watch preachers on TV or whenever I, I I'm... I want to hear a little bit of unction. I mean, I, will, I, will, I just want to, know, uh, to feel in my own heart that this man really believes what he's saying. Amen? I always got to think back to what old Abraham Lincoln said years ago. I agree with him 100%. He said, when I go to hear a preacher preach, I want to see him preach like he's fighting a swarm of bees. Amen? In other words, he said, I want to see this guy get down and get with the program. So I'm sure one of those, one of the, you know, a, a very dull, mild ball type preachers, a way he wouldn't like it too much. I'm probably right there with Abe myself. I remember years ago when my wife and I, when we were younger in the ministry and everything, we would all we would go every year to the Southern Baptist Convention Evangelism Conference. Generally, it was up in Fort Worth, and uh, uh, the Dallas Fort Worth area. And so one day we went to, and I believe Kate was with me on that one, but uh, we went to see the the conference and boy, they had some good preachers. And there was a guy I'd never heard before, 
I knew about the little book he had written. He wrote a book called The Master Plan of Evangelism because it was taught in a lot of Bible colleges and seminaries. I had it whenever I was in Bible college. And his name was Robert Cole. And I don't even remember the message he preached, but I can still visually see him preaching. He's the only guy that I've ever seen that preached and he had his Bible holding it up like this, and he would stomp that right, that right leg all the time, and you could hear it on that platform. Boom! 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 So I won't forget that. He made an impression on me. I don't remember a thing he said. <laughs> but that's been a long time ago. A lot of things I don't even remember what was said yesterday. Amen? Oh, man. It's tough whenever you're getting old. But I do remember that. I remember that clearly. But you see, he, he, had, he was preaching the way the Spirit of God was moving him to preach. And he had some fire. There was fire coming from that place. And there was a great big old indention in that platform when he got through. They kind of had to go in for repairs later on. Here's something else in verse 2 of chapter 4. He instructs the flock. That has to do with the teaching aspect of his ministry. It says, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and what teaching. And so he's instructing the flock. He is teaching them. What does he teach? Sound doctrine, because that's what he talks about in verse 3. He says, Timothy, we're going to come to a point where they're not going to want to hear anything about sound doctrine anymore. And I'm going to tell you what, the church is moving away from doctrine and sound doctrine. Doctrine is nothing more than teaching. Okay? That's what it means. The early church continued in the apostles' doctrine. And today, there are a lot of churches and they say it, some of these younger ministers, I don't know if they're called of God or not. But they're in this, what they call the emergent church. And there are a lot of things, and I know, I'm square. And I, I'm, I'm an old fogey, I know that. But that's okay. We need to get back to some of that stuff. Because we're moving away from sound doctrine. In fact, the emergent church will tell you we're not interested in doctrine. We're interested in just the practical teaching of the Bible. But you don't see that in the Scripture. There's nothing wrong. I mean, there's so much practical stuff in the Bible. There's no doubt about that. But even, let's take, let's take James for example. You can't get more practical than James. And yet, even with his teaching about practical Christianity, he's got doctrine or teachings right in the mix. And some of these guys, I mean, you, you'll see them. And they're not going to wear a suit like I'm wearing, but they'll have usually maybe some jeans on. They may even have some holy jeans on. And they may have a little stool over here where they sit down or a little chair. And they want to have a conversation with their congregation. Well, verse 2 here says, preach the word. That was my charge whenever they, when, when that church charged me that day and gave me my charge, that was the highlight of it. If you're going to go out there and you're going to be a pastor or a preacher or that, what are you going to do? Preach the word. And I'm sorry, a lot of the stuff that's being done today in some of the churches is not preaching. It's nothing more than just a, a little talk. 
Anybody can give a little talk. But where is the fire from the pulpits today? All right. Here's something else from verses 3 and 4 that we read. Number 3, he warns the flock, and that has to do with his, the protecting aspect of his ministry. He's warning. What's he warning against? False teaching. Be careful about what you're getting into, flock. Chew on everything you hear, but don't swallow everything you hear. Investigate it with the Word of God. Paul said, test the spirits and see whether or not they are of God. Amen. And he warns, the pastor warns the flock to stay close to Jesus, to stay in the Word of God. And he warns the church of what can happen if you don't do those things. And how easy it is to slip away. And the next thing you know, you're a carnal Christian. And you have no excitement, no joy, no real peace. Because you're not walking in the Spirit anymore. He warns. There's three more things that the pastor does. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter, I mean 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter to the right in your Bible. 1 Peter chapter 5. And there are three things in one verse that shows what the pastor does. 1 Peter chapter 5. Peter says he's talking about the elders. He says, I'm exhorting you elders. Elders are pastors. And here's what he says in verse 2. Shepherd the flock of God. And so what should a pastor do? He shepherds the flock. Amen. He shepherds the flock. And that speaks of the caring aspect of his ministry. You see, in a flock of sheep, you're going to have younglings. Got to kind of watch after them a little bit. You're going to have older sheep that need a little bit more attention. You're going to have healthy sheep. You don't have to, you know, they, they can take care of themselves okay. You don't have to, to deal with them that much. And you got sick sheep. They need a little extra attention. And so that's what Pastor does. He shepherds. The caring aspect of his ministry. So he exhorts, he instructs, he warns, he shepherds. There's something else in this verse. Continue on. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers. Don't miss that word serving there. You see, the pastor serves the flock. And that speaks of his giving. The giving aspect of his ministry. Just as Christ came to serve and give himself a ransom for many, the pastor is there to serve. And if necessary, lay down his life for the flock. You say, oh, pastor, you wouldn't do that. Let me tell you something. Years ago, we were over in Guatemala on a mission trip. And I may have told you the story about it. So, uh, you remember those, I don't know if I told you, did I tell you one where we got, where bullets were flying and all that? Okay? Now, it's kind of long, I can't tell you that, okay? I'll tell you about that story later on. But I have some of my flock. We were there. And I'm telling you, when I get stopped in the middle of a message, I was preaching on Zacchaeus that night, too. <laughs> one of my favorite passages. And they say, hey, we got to shut everything down. We got gangs out here, and there's we've got bullets flying everywhere. They've got a gang war going on. And so anyway, as they're funneling us out, when we finally heard the gunfire, you know, die down, and they're funneling us out, I'm thinking as I'm watching. Some of my even younger members come out. Lord, I'll go first. I'm willing to lay down my life for my sheep. But you know what? 
I was amazed because what I saw the Guatemalan Christians do is in every alley as we were snaking our way through the city to cross the bridge and get back over to the van that we had to park way off because we knew we were in a very dangerous area and if we parked closer to the church, we wouldn't have any tires or anything left on that van. Amen. They'd been gone. And as we're doing that, you'd have three or four Guatemalan Christians where there's an alley, and they would get up there and they would stand in that alley so if any bullets come that way, they get the bullet, and the American Christians, they're safe. Now let me tell you something. When you see that with your own eye, you have to ask yourself, would I be willing to do that for an African brother? Or a Filipino brother of the Lord? Would I do that? We ought to. We're brothers and sisters in the Lord. Amen? I'll tell you something. If you know Jesus as your Savior, I am closer to you than I am to my blood kin. And even on mission trips when we had youth, wherever I, wherever we went, I was protecting those young people. Part of my flock. And I was protecting them. Something else. Look what it says. Serving as overseer. And so this speaks of the fact that the pastor leads the flock and he oversees. That's part of his ministry as a leader. He is overseeing. He leads the flock to do God's work, God's way, according to God's will and God's word. That's what he does. And so he exhorts, instructs, warns, shepherds, serves, leads and that's all a part of preaching teaching, protecting, caring, giving overseeing, how many of you would say that the pastor has a little bit of responsibility actually has a whole lot of responsibility you know pastors were once highly respected in the United States I would say it's not as far back as maybe 20 years ago, 15 years ago. There was a, a great deal of respect to pastors. It's not that way today. I'm going to tell you it right now. Part of it has been speaking as a part of the clergy or minister, ministers, whatever you want to call us, it's been part of our fault. Because you've had a lot of pastors that have fallen. They've gotten into sin. They've done things that they shouldn't have done. And it's hurt not only the church, but it's also hurt the testimony to the world around us, to the people. I still believe, I believe that Jimmy Swagger is a saved man. But he had a mighty fall years ago. How many of you remember that? But I've often wondered how many people did that affect and push away from coming to Christ? There's, there have been a lot of casualties. I've seen the casualties when I was with the other association. We had casualties, minister, minister casualties up there. There, while there has been a lot of casualties, when I say casualties, I'm talking about ministers that have had to go, they've had to get out of the ministry. Or they have been basically cut off because of their behaviors and because of what they've done. And while that's the case, I want to tell you what, I praise God for 
all of the younger ministers that he is raising up today that are actually standing upon the word of God and they're being faithful. That doesn't mean they need to watch out because they do. You have to be careful in your ministry. When I was younger as a pastor, I was very, very careful. I did not ride around with any of my younger women, folks in my church. I'd have somebody else with me. I was very, very, very careful. You say, well, what was the big deal? Let me tell you something. All it takes is for one person to start talking. Amen? And the next thing you know, you weren't just helping so-and-so in your congregation to get to a destination she needed to go to, but something happened along the way. Amen? And whether it's true or not, once it starts circulating, all you got to do is just watch Andy Griffin. Those little old ladies, Barney had a scratch on his trigger finger, and they had him killed off. What, in a couple of hours? He was dead. <laughs> I'm just simply saying, I thank God for all of the ones that are really standing for the Word of God. Praise God for that. And the pastors today. Uh, there are a lot of ministers that are retired. They were in little old bitty churches, whatever, and they, they have hardly no retirement whatsoever. And so one of the things that I help support as part of my giving, extra giving to the Lord, is I support and give to the uh, these retired pastors or their widows that don't have hardly much money to pay bills and pay medicine. Medic medical supplies and things like that. And that's through the convention. It's called Mission Dignity. And so I, I try to make sure every month I send a little bit to help out these folks. But I appreciate it. They put in long, long years in the ministry. And they were in little churches that couldn't, they couldn't afford to pay them very much. But they gave it all for Jesus. I'll do what I can to help them out. I can't, may not be able to give a whole lot, but I can give some. Amen? So I thank God for the pastors. I, I thank God for that particular gift uh, that God has given. Now let's go to teachers right quick. The gift of teacher, and I'm throwing in teaching on this, and that's seen in Romans 12, 7. So I'm going to put teaching in here too, so that when we get to the serving gifts, we will move, uh, we, we probably need to deal with that. Uh, let me give you a definition. It's on the screen there. A person whom the Lord has given to the church. I believe teachers are given to the churches. And gifted with the special ability to communicate spiritual truth from the Word of God in such a way that believers grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Scriptures. Now, those who have the gift of teaching the Word of God are a major part of the ministry of a local church. Major part. They are instructing others in the Word of God. And Spirit-filled teachers are gifted to communicate and to convey spiritual truths from the Bible. Not just to communicate it, but to get it across. And we need those spirit-filled teachers today. By the way, there is a difference, for example, between one who teaches a subject in a public school, for example, teaches math, or maybe teaches... Uh, uh, geometry or something like that or, or some other subject 
There's a difference between teaching like that and coming in and opening up the Word of God and teaching from the Word of God. There is a big, big difference. You've got to be able to communicate spiritual truth. And by the way, anyone aspiring to be a teacher should always remember James 3.1. Here it is on the screen. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. So myself, I'm a teacher. Anybody else who teaches from the Word of God just needs to realize that when we stand before the Lord, we're going to get a little bit of a stricter judgment. Okay? That's why it's very important that whenever you're bringing a lesson from the Word of God that you've taken the time to study it through, to look and see what some of the other great teachers have had to say, to take a Bible dictionary and use that, a concordance, have that in hand, all these things, and look at the Scriptures and allow God to help you understand them and then ask Him to help you to get that across to the people that you're teaching. So it's very important. That's a that's not one of my favorite verses. Okay? Stricter judgment. It's coming for us who teach. Now, I thank the Lord for all teachers. But I believe he is the one who raises up in local church. Pastors can't do it all. They can't do all the teaching. You have to have various teachers. And I believe the Lord, you know, I don't really lays it on the heart of an individual. But with the gift of teaching, that spiritual gift of teaching, that individual is able to get into the Bible and to bring things out to their particular class. And that is very, very important. So I thank God. I thank God for all the teachers here at First Baptist Church. I pray for you. I pray you'll have wisdom and that you will do well in your teaching. Years ago, a preacher friend of mine, and he's a casual, by the way. It's, it's so sad because I'm telling you, that guy had, he had the fire of the Lord. He could have easily been a very high ranking evangelist. There's no doubt about that. But years ago, he made a comment to me one day. He told me that he no longer read commentaries or, or uh, any other books that, that dealt with passages he wasn't listening to what they had to say. And he said, the Spirit of God is my teacher. Now he based that on 1 John 2.27. And I want you to look at this. 1 John 2.27. 1 John 2.27. And here's what it says. But the anointing which you have received from him, Jesus, abides in you. That anointing is the Holy Spirit. And you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, that is the Holy Spirit is your teacher, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it is taught you, you will abide in him. Now what he had done, he had picked up on that little phrase there, you do not need anyone teaching. I went to the verse, I looked at it, of course, if you put it in the context with verse 26, John says, these things I've written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. So in the context, he's talking about deceivers. And you just need to be careful and always rely on the Holy Spirit to teach you what's right and wrong. Okay? That's what it means in the context. 
But it does not mean that you should not take in information from other godly teachers that God has raised up great spiritual men and women of God that have a way of bringing, getting in and coming out with something that you may not be able to come up with and see. And there are a lot of godly teachers that have been out there. I'm thankful, you know, in, in my growing up as a born-again believer, uh, I am thankful for people like Chaos, great Bible teacher, Precepts for, uh, Precepts for Life, I believe that's what it's called. But she had a good program out for a long time. Great teacher of the Word of God. David Jeremiah is a pastor and a teacher. John MacArthur is primarily just a teacher. But he's a very good teacher. And so many other great programs and great Bible teachers that they learned the game. All these people. But you see, God has raised them up to help the body of Christ. And what I would say to my preacher friend, wherever he may be right now, whatever he may be doing, no, you don't need that anyone teach you in that the Spirit of God is basically your teacher. But we all need Spirit-filled teachers come from God. Otherwise, why do you have the gift of teaching? Why did God give it? If you do not need people like that, then why do you have the gifted person of teaching? You see, he was wrong. Well, As I said, I'm thankful for all the teachers that God raises up, all the pastors that God raises up. And I know that, you know, uh, I'm winding down. I'm not as young as I used to be. I used to, I used to spin on the platform like a top, folks. <laughs> I can still do it to a, to a degree. I can get around. But I don't, I don't have that super fast mobility that I used to have. In one of my earlier churches, I'd get right on the edge of the platform. And, I, and this lady, she kept saying, I'm just, I've just been waiting for you to just fall flat off that platform. Well, if I'd have fell, I'd have fell right in her lap. Amen? <laughs> but, you know, I don't, I don't have the the vigor that I had when I was younger, but I still got a little fire. I still got a little bit of fire. And I'm thankful for that. And hopefully, in my teaching aspect of the ministry that I do, that I'm helping to instruct you and help building you up in the faith helping you to learn a little bit more because that's what I want to see. I, I want to see our, our body, our sheep growing in the Lord and, and that's what's important. And more than anything else, see you just fired up with Jesus. Man, he's worth getting fired up about, amen? I, I mean, we, folks, it's been one day and it may not be, but just right around the corner, we're, we're going to be like a rocket ship launching off this earth. Amen. And we're going to go meet Jesus in the air. And it's going to be one, one fun trip. It's going to be one. So praise God for that. Well, that's the support gifts. And, and I hope we've been able to, you know, to be able to clarify these things and you can understand why I have them under that category and you know a little bit more about pastors and teachers and apostles and prophets and evangelists. So praise God for that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time together. And Father, we can rejoice, bask in your love, 
and the way that uh, you move us and teach us and show us the things of God. Uh, Lord, we, we're so thankful that you gave us your word. And this book, the Bible, the scripture is very clear that while the, the flower may fade and the grass may wither, the word of our God is going to stand forever. We're always going to have the Bible. And even, even though there's been a little bit of a movement of, in Texas here of ban the Bible, a little bit of a drive there, thank God that we've got good people in government in Texas that have been able to hold down some of these things. And, and we thank you for that. Father, we ask you now, as we go into a little short time of invitation, that you would Minister to our hearts and show us if there's anything that we need to do today in relation to you. God, do we need to come to the altar? Is there some, something we need to pray about right here at the altar where we meet with you? Some person we need to pray about. Someone you're laying on our heart right now. And we need to come. We need to get close to you here at the altar. I believe that's where you really meet with us in a very real way. Maybe someone needs to come today and rededicate dedicate their life to you, Jesus. As far as I know, Lord, everybody here has already made decisions for Jesus. If we have someone that hasn't truly given their heart and life to you, I pray that you show them this is the time they need to come because today is the day of salvation. Lord, whatever you would lay on our hearts to do today in the way of rededication, prayer, commitment, whatever it might be, testimony, God, show us what we need to do. We'll do it during this time of invitation. Lord, pray in Jesus' name. Amen.